Well, there are people who are sitting in this room glued to the internet. So, um, you have to remember that when I started in television uh, in 1966, there were two television, and we're talking about Britain now, there were two television channels. There was, I'm talking about Britain, yes. Uh, there's the BBC, which, as I've explained, is not a state organisation, but a public service broadcaster. And there was commercial television, which was paid for by the advertisers. Which was, in the early days, not necessarily a bad thing, because commercial television news, for example, was thought to be much uh, quicker and more interesting than the BBC News. And the BBC News had to wake up to the fact they had competition. It's competition. Two channels. Now, in England, I think we have 60. 60 channels. That's not including the internet, and not including all the other ways in which information can come to us. So everything that we get, whether drama or documentaries or plays or reality shows, is completely fragmented across all of these channels. All across. And the choice is enormous. And we tend to think that because the reality shows attract the most attention, that everything else is gone. It hasn't. It's there. We have a channel, for example, at the BBC, which is called BBC Four, which I defy anybody to say that there isn't at least one, sometimes two, often three, often a whole evening of absolutely extraordinary uh, films, documentaries, dramas, every night, every night. That's just one channel. It's also... A frequent complaint of, of uh, I'm just talking about British television now, it's a frequent complaint that in the old days we had a tradition of the play on television. It's called the Wednesday play or the Thursday play. You know, great dramatists were commissioned to write plays. So Harold Pinter would write a play. Samuel, no, Samuel Beckett never wrote a play. But the great, so there was a tradition of, of commissioning new, exciting drama for the BBC, or the British television. Last Sunday night, uh, on, the, on Channel 4, which is not BBC 4, but Channel 4, which is a commercial channel, was part one of the second series of a serial called Homeland. Have you heard about Homeland? Homeland. It's made in America, but with a British star, and it's possibly the most extraordinary. At the, at the um, Emmy Awards recently, it won everything. Best drama, best actor, best actress, everything. It's an absolutely remarkable drama about what it is to be a political spy, uh, a terrorist spy now in the United States. Absolutely amazing. Amazing. So the idea that we don't have great drama anymore is nonsense. It's just not now called play for today or play for Wednesday. It's now whatever this drama is called. We had an incredible series on uh, this on the BBC. Have you heard of these dramas here in in, um, in Ukraine? Uh, they're called Valanda. Valanda. They're made in Sweden uh, uh, by um, a Swedish writer called Henning Mankell. They also won every award that it was possible to win. Some of the most important philosophers in England today written huge articles about how important this series was to understand the mind of a criminal. Well, Ander is a Swedish detective who is always going looking for, I mean, there's always a murder or something, but the plot is not interesting. What's interesting is the psychology of the people there in the thing. Now, does the name uh, Richard Dawkins mean anything to you? Richard Dawkins, the, great, the greatest living... Selfish gene? Yes, selfish gene, the greatest living evolutionary biologist. I mean, uh, uh, one of the most eminent scientists alive. 
An atheist, yes, also an atheist, yes, he's also an atheist. But the most important thing about him in this conversation is that he is a, a very, very great scientist. It so happens that I know him quite well. He rang up um, about three or four years ago, and I was watching well under uh, the one particular episode. And I said, Richard, I can't talk to you now. I'm watching Wallander. What is that? Well, it's a Swedish drama. Yes, I imagine you doing something stupid like that on a Saturday night. And you put the phone down. So uh, I, I rang him back at the end of the episode. And I, I said, Richard, actually, why don't you try watching it next week? And tell me what you think. He's the greatest scientist, one of the great scientists of our time. He rang up at the end of the episode the following week. And he said... I've never seen anything like that. This is the most amazing drama I've ever seen because it's about what's going on up here in the mind. Don't forget he's a scientist. So it can attract people like that. So the idea that you know television now isn't making much better drama than it ever made before, isn't making much better documentaries than it made before, much better music programs than it made before, is complete nonsense. It's just that there are so many channels Yes, if you want to be stupid and you sit and watch, you can sit and watch reality shows 24 hours a day. That's your problem. That's not the problem of the people who run the television companies. People who run the television companies try to provide something for everybody. But the standard of the better part of television, if I can call it that, has never, ever been higher. Thank you. We can only wait for the British television. І я би хотів перейти вже до наступної частини нашої зустрічі. Це питання аудиторії до Тоні Палмера. І поки ви готуєте свої запитання, чи хочете їх сформулювати, я хотів би нагадати, що Тоні Палмер, він зняв понад 120 фільмів художніх, документальних. Вони стосуються не тільки музики, але й мистецтва, культури, письменників, архітекторів. Ось, і є е, володаря понад 40 міжнародних нагород. Прікс Італія – це є найбільш престижна нагорода в галузі телебачення і телевізійних фільмів. Він е, здобув її двічі. Ось. І фільмографія Тоні Палмера дуже цікава. От, один з його найвидатніших фільмів, який триває понад 7 годин, це фільм про Ріхарда Вагнера. В цьому фільмі знялися, ну просто світила кіно, це Ванеса Гетерейф, Лоуренс Олів'є, Річард Бартон та багато інших. І також це фільм про Стравіцького чи Шостаковича. Фільм про Шостаковича зіграв актор Бен Кінгслі, який раніше отримав Оскар попередні, за свою попередню роботу в якості Ганні. Це такі цікаві факти, і я чекаю на ваші підняті руки, я буду підходити з мікрофоном, аби перекладач міг перекласти питання для Тоні. Прошу. Yes, please ask some questions. Uh, я хочу запитатися, чи відомий вам такий канадський режисер, як Сем Дан, і як ви ставитеся до його роботи «Політ-666»? Master program of journalism, uh, my, uh, and uh, I got a question. Uh, everyone have uh, uh, some um, ideals uh, and uh, some kumer, uh, and uh, have you um, some people uh, for whom uh, you want uh, to, to look like? Uh, who is? Uh, your ideals in uh, cinema and uh, in uh, movie making? Well, 
Well, I mean, the, the, I mean, I have people in journalism I admire, and I have people in films I admire. I mean, I think anybody who's mad enough to be a war correspondent, especially today, I think, no, not especially today, but ever, these are some of the most important witnesses for what is really going on in the world. And I think if I wanted to be a journalist, then I would want to be a war correspondent, dangerous though it is, simply because they're trying to tell us what the politicians do not want us to know about. And that's the responsibility of all great journalists, to tell the truth. And you can be sure, and this is true in England, I know it's true in Ukraine, that the politicians don't want to tell us the truth. They can't tell us the truth, even if they knew what the truth was. So the point of being a journalist, in the, in the true sense, is to find the truth and to tell the truth, whatever the risks. And the risks are always enormous. Just think what is happening in Russia today. It's appalling. It's absolutely terrible, terrifying. Now, this is not an attack on Russia today, because in the United States it's just as bad. When you watch uh, Mitt Romney, can you imagine President Romney? God. I mean, I'm not sure I like Obama, but I think I'll settle for Obama, who's the devil you know, rather than Romney, who's an idiot. Um, but, you know, can you imagine in the debates between Romney and Obama, that either of them are telling the truth? Of course they're not. I mean, Obama is spending an enormous sum of money to find out about Romney's tax affairs. Romney is spending an enormous amount of money to find out about uh, Obama's uh, birth certificate. No, do you seriously think that those are the most important things in the United States today? Of course they're not. Why is nobody asking questions about these drones that are going into Pakistan and killing huge numbers of people? Children, innocent people. Do we know how many drones are sent in every year? No, we don't. So what is a journalist for? To tell the truth. And those journalists that I admire, admire are the great war correspondents, not just of now, but of the Second World War. Incredibly brave people. Um, I mentioned Richard Dawkins. Now, it so happens that Richard Dawkins' wife, her father, uh, was the first person to arrive, literally the first person to arrive at Belson. And he famously made some broadcasts describing what Belson looked like. Can you imagine that? That's what a journalist is. That's the definition of a journalist, to tell the truth. Answer your question, second part of the question, about filmmakers. Yes, there are three filmmakers. There are lots of filmmakers I admire. Um, I think uh, Francis Ford Coppola is an astonishing filmmaker. I think Apocalypse Now is one of the two greatest war films ever made. I'll tell you the other one in a minute. Um, Steven Spielberg is an incredible filmmaker. Uh, all right, some of it is god-awful. But, I mean, Jurassic Park is an extraordinary leap of the imagination. Schindler's List, for all its sentimentality at the end, but I keep being unsure about the end, uh, is still an extraordinary piece of filmmaking. I mean, I, I remember after three and a quarter hours, of the first time I watched Schindler's List, of coming out shaking, because it told exactly what had happened in Krakow, um, or in Flashoff, which was the concentration camp. Terrifying, simple, it's a very simple film when you look at it. We go back to filmmaking. It has virtually no style. It's just simple black and white pictures, one after another. It's terrifying. Wonderful filmmaker. But the three, for me, the three greatest filmmakers of all, not in any order of importance, but people I think, you know, they had something that nobody else has, that as far as I, I can see, and that have been an enormous influence on me. Enormous influence on me. Uh, the first is Orson Welles. Now, Orson Welles is, is a very complicated story, Orson Welles. Um, but every image in Orson Welles is, doesn't owe anything to anybody. Where did he get these ideas? I mean, I watched only a week or so ago, 
famous film of the Kafka novel, The Trial. And I'm sitting thinking, that's an incredible image. Where did that come from? Where did, how did he think of that? So Orson Welles, in terms of this proliferation of astonishing images, amazing. And of course his treatment by Hollywood was disgraceful. Orson Welles, who I knew, he was his own worst enemy. I mean, he destroyed his career successfully, more successfully than anybody could, but he was a very great filmmaker. Ingmar Bergman, intellectually, is the one that I'm frightened of. Uh, if you have never seen a film called The Seventh Seal, I don't know what that is in Ukrainian. But the man who won the film of the church, Ingmar Bergman. Is it the Seventh Seal? Seventh Seal. That, that, I think, is one of the most amazing films ever made. It deals with death and what one's responsibility in life is. It's got a character called Death. And if you've never seen it, you should see it and look at it and study it if you're interested in filmmaking. That's, again, one astonishing image after another. But he never loses sight of a very simple story which he tells wonderfully. And it leaves you thinking forever. And I do mean forever. I think I first saw that film uh, when I was 19. And I'm now 119. And I can tell you every image in the film. It stays with me right here. But perhaps the most important one of the three, for me at least, uh, and this is not just because I knew him quite well, is Kubrick. Why Kubrick? Well, Kubrick in my own life was very, very important. Because um, this is long before I met him and long before I got to know him. That um, when I was, the first film I ever made uh, was, had a narrator. I thought that's how you did documentaries. You put a narrator. The narrator told you what to think and what to look at. Here's so and so, there's so and so, and here's so and so. And while I was editing, I began editing the second film that I made, which I referred to earlier called All My Loving, the damage was done in that, you know, I had all these tricks I got, that's a separate issue. I went to see in London, 2001, which I do think is one of the greatest films ever made. And I'm sitting watching the first 25 minutes of 2001, which, as you know, I'm sure you've seen it, is the scene with the apes and the police. 25 minutes goes by, and nobody says a word. Not a word. But Kubrick found a way to tell the story. You never get lost. You know exactly what's going on. You know exactly what's in these apes' minds. Not 100%. That's the point. You'll be pulled in. You've got to think. That's the point about great art. You're not, you've got to think all the time. But Kubrick found a way to tell the story where you're never lost. You're never confused. You're completely hooked. 25 minutes without a single word. And I remember seeing this film coming out and tearing up the commentary I had written for All My Loving. I thought, I've got to find a way to tell a story without commentary. And in every film I've made since, I have no commentary whatsoever. Kubrick's importance as a filmmaker, I think, 2001 is just one example, is, as Bogdan, I think, said, is you are aware that he's holding up a huge mirror to us to our world, to our society, and saying, this is it, this is you, don't look away, because I'm telling you exactly what kind of mess you have made of the world in which you live. Which, the greatest example is the other great film about war, Full Metal Jacket. You can never see Full Metal Jacket and forget what being a soldier is, for example, and all the problems that brings being a soldier. You can never watch the last film, Eyes Wide Shut, and forgetting what it is like to be in love, or what that means, and what loyalty means, and honesty means. They are incredible mirrors to our society. So Kubrick, uh, Bing Bergman, and Wells, those are my three heroes. Those, I think, are the most, arguably the most influential filmmakers of all time. They will never, they will never be they will be equaled, I'm sure, but they will never be bettered into what they presented us with. And the legacy is just extraordinary. So, War Correspondent or Stanley Kubrick? You choose.
Добрий день, мене звати Юлія, магітерська програма журналістика ОКО. Я хотіла вас запитати, стосовно того, як ви ставитеся до своїх фільмів. Чи ви їх переглядаєте, чи ви повертаєтеся до ідей цих фільмів, чи це вже для вас відпрацьований матеріал і ви вже про це не думаєте? І з глином часу, чи хотіли б ви щось змінити в ваших фільмах? І якщо ж хотіли, то що ви хотіли змінити? Дякую. А де тут? I'm not embarrassed by what I do. But once it's finished, it's finished. I made a big, um, it's very famous series called All You Need Is Love, History of American Popular Music. We made it in 1975-1976. The number of times, uh, I mean, four or five times a year, I am offered huge sums of money to, why don't you go and bring it up to date, revise it, you know, have another go. It's finished. When you're editing a film, uh, you know all the things that are wrong with it. All the things. But there comes a point where you've got to stop, because otherwise you'd go on fiddling with it forever and ever. And you don't make it any better, you just make it slightly different. So, to answer your question directly, my answer is, as soon as I finish the film, I'll watch it in the, the, the first public screening, and it's not true that I never watch it again. But I don't. I try not to watch them again. Not because I'm, I'm embarrassed by them, but because you know, I'm now interested in the new one or the new two, or the new three is in my case, you know, I'm often making 30 films at the same time. That's what's interesting, because you've got to go on renewing your energy and renewing your creativity. You can't keep looking back, oh, that's a good film, I'm glad I did that, it's very nice, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm asked quite a lot to go to retrospectives. It's death! I can tell you, it's death! I do not want to be reminded of something I made 30 years ago. Not because I think it's no good, that's not for me to judge. But just, you want me to show my new film, I'll be right there. Old film, not really. Thanks very much. Very nice of you, very grateful, but no. It's, it's, it's difficult, it's difficult, it's difficult to, to be really truthful about it, because of course, you know, I have a sneaking, I like some films that I've done, I don't like other films that I've done. But and it's not that I don't want to be reminded of them, I'm reminded of them much too often. Uh, but I'm only interested in the one I'm doing now. I'll talk to you about the one I'm doing now for the next week. The one I finished two months ago, I don't want to talk about. Mr. Tony, when you were in the film, you said that you were in the film, that it was available. Але як ви дбаєте про контекст? Чи ви стараєтеся якось максимально показати глядачу власне, контекст? Ну, чи, чи тої особи, того часу? I mean, that's, uh, it's a very good question. The answer is you have to, you must. I mean, artists don't exist in isolation for everything that's going on around them. Uh, I mentioned Shostakovich earlier. You can't make a film about Shostakovich and not do something about the Soviet Union and the times that Shostakovich lived and worked. Because if you make a film about Shostakovich as a musician, as a, a great musician, great composer, and you don't say anything about the background, you don't even begin to understand what Shostakovich was trying to do. So the context is absolutely crucial. I mean, it really is very important. Uh, I made, um, uh, for example, I made a film um, about, um, the film that I will talk about, which I finished two months ago. Uh, the, the film I just finished was a film about a very great uh, South African playwright called Athol Fugard. 
Now, Anton Krugard, who's 80 this year, he, uh, I'm not sure that his plays have ever come here, but uh, he uh, began to write plays during the apartheid regime. And he wrote about the apartheid regime. But not in a straightforward political way, you know, saying apartheid, bad system. But he wrote about particular people who were caught up in the system and what happened to them. Now, I could make a film, I uh, went to South Africa and I was in South Africa for a long time and I uh, made a film and I filmed Anton Fugard talking and I filmed lots of extracts from the plays. But to really understand the power of those plays and the effect that those plays had, you needed to show your work the context. You needed to show this is what the apartheid regime was really like. So one of the things that we did, for example, is we went to film, we got special permission uh, from Mandela himself to go and film on Robin Island, you know, which is the island of Cape Town where he was imprisoned. And when you go to Robin Island, then you finally begin to understand how appalling that was. As one of the people in the film says, it was like living death. Apart from anything else, you stand on Robin Island and you look across the bay and there's Cape Town. There's real life. And I'm on this island and I can't get off it. So, in order to make a, an interesting film, I thought, about Athol Fugard, I thought it was very necessary to film the context. So I don't think you can make any film about any artist and not show the context. The context is absolutely crucial. Доброго дня, Надія Калачон, магістерська програма журналістики ОКО. Мені е, дуже заімпонувала ваша ідея, яку ви говорили про Марію Калас і про коніка, фільм про якого ви знімали, те, що, е, те, що вони є перш за все люди, а лише потім або актори, або музиканти. Мені вдалася ця ідея дуже близькою мені і дуже гарною. В контексті цього я маю питання. В Україні досить такі е, приземлені е, ситуації з музикою. Наприклад, е, в нас е, більшість водіїв маршрутки стру, слухають шансон. І для такої більш освіченої спільноти є велика спокуса на таких людях поштав, поставити штамп. А, це людина, яка слухає шансон. Що з нею можна взяти? Що з нею можна розмовляти? І е, в контексті цього, що я сказала, у мене є ці запитання до вас. Як ви вважаєте, що музичний смак, музичні уподобання можуть сказати про людину? І ще також дотичне запитання, що музичний смак цілого покоління може сказати про це покоління? Дякую. Це дуже цікаве питання. Ви писали про Well, it's a pity, because you should. I'd be very interested to read it. I mean, it's a very interesting question. Listen, if there's any consolation, English bus drivers listen to the same rubbish. <laughs> so don't worry about them being Ukrainian, they listen to rubbish. Um, it's, uh, let me start around another way. I, um, I understand the question, of course. Uh, it's back to Stravinsky, I'm afraid. Uh, Stravinsky, in the course of the first interview I did with him, he said there were only three kinds of music. Good music, bad music, and non-music, which is noise. Then after a little while, he, he said, now wait a second, I think there are only two kinds of music. There's that, which is in your face, aggressive music, and then there's that. And he did it with his hand, the music which pulls towards you. Which is, again, a very interesting definition, if you think about it. Now, of course, that doesn't answer the question about how do we make these value judgments, you know, that that's good, that's bad. That's a whole separate question. But go back to good music, bad music, non-music. The important thing about that definition, I think, is that he would make no distinction between, since we've been talking about pop music, popular music, as it were, and classical music. I mean, there are, there are, believe it or not, there are some terrible Beatles songs, you know, which should never ever be performed. They're so awful. I mean, they're simple, plain, boring, repetitive, no inspiration at all. We know there are some wonderful Beatles songs. There are some boring Mozart 
I'm sorry to tell you there's some unbelievably dreary Mozart, which we get played in the concert hall because it says Mozart, and it shouldn't be played. And it's just, it's not his fault, you know, if you're writing at the speed he was writing at. In other words, it doesn't really make any difference whether you're talking about Mozart or whether you're talking about the Beatles. Um, there's good and there's bad within. That still doesn't answer the question of how do we make these value judgments? Why do we make these value judgments? How do we make these value judgments? And the only thing I can, the only clue I can give you is that we know, for example, if we take some of the great people's songs, not many of which we heard last night at the concert, unfortunately, but if you do take some of the really great Beatles songs, why is it that uh, 50 years later we are still playing them? They must have something which gives them long life. If you take Don Giovanni, Mozart, why is it... Uh, let me think. Uh, oh, God, my math's no good. Uh, over 200 years later, we are still playing Don Giovanni because there's something about it which has long life. Now, if you took... If you, if you could read the... whatever it is, the Ukrainian daily newspaper, of the year 1791, which is when Mozart died, as you know. And here's a list of the top ten composers of that time. I'll bet you Mozart wasn't there, because there were other people who were played more often. Played on reality shows, if you see what I mean. Had greater public appeal. But in the end, that's not how you judge them. I think something about them, something about the quality of what is being written, if we're just talking about music, seems to emerge and continue. Why are we as fascinated by the Bach show suites today as the audience in Leipzig must have been when they were first written? I have no idea, except we are, because they are perfectly formed, they are completely logical internally, they are melodically totally new, they are instrumentally this is a miracle. How is he making all those sounds? From and so on and so on and so on. You can make a list of things, a list of qualities that any particular work of art has. Why do we find the statues of, of um, Rodin, for example, or the Greek statues? Why are Greek statues still thought to be very beautiful? Well, they're perfectly formed. Venus de Milo has lost her arm, or arms. Um, but there's something about the, the, the internal perfection of what it is that you're looking at. Why is the Mona Lisa so extraordinary? Because you look at it and you have no idea what... what, what I mean, it's, it's just the perfect portrait. Who is this woman? What is she doing? What is she thinking? You know, it's that. What is she thinking? Where did she come from? What did she have for breakfast? All of those questions you occur to you when you're looking at this astonishing painting. I'm not talking about the Mona Lisa now. Now, if it was a boring picture, you'd have a quick look and say, I don't care who she is, I don't care where she comes from, da 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 It's back to the Stravinsky. I think a great work of art is possibly defined by, possibly defined by, the extent to which it forces you to think. Forces you. There's something about it which is doing this to you all the time. It forces you to think about it. And think again about it. And think again and again and again. I go back to the Ingmar Bergman film that I mentioned. Why is it that here, rather more years than I care to remember, 100 years ago, I still remember exactly every one of those scenes, every one of those images. There's something miraculous about it. But that's why. In my evaluation, it's a great work of art because it's here. It's imprinted in here. I can't get rid of it. I wish I could get rid of it because I close my eyes and I see it now. That's what a great work of art is. It forces you to think and it leaves you with something which won't go away. Okay. Uh, my name is Irena. I'm the student of history program here at GCU, and I have a question about the concert last night. I know you were a guest at the Lviv Philharmonic, and I want to ask you what are your impressions <laughs> of the concert? And also, my second question is, yesterday you were talking that Schubert was a classical composer for the time when you were making a movie about Beatles. And for us, 
uh, Beatles is like a classic nowadays. And what do you think, what, what kind of music will be the classics for the next generation? What are your comments? Thank you. Well, I can tell you it won't be Andrew Lloyd Webber. I'll put money on it. To be serious about your question, the concert last night was very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, I'm not, I thought the girl who sang Michelle was wonderful. And that's not really to say that some of the other performers were not also good. But there, there were good performers and there were bad performers. That's inevitable. But I thought what was really interesting was it kept occurring to me that at the time that that music happened, that, those, uh, that the Beatles began in the mid-60s, uh, that, at that time, mid-60s and the 70s and the early 80s, I travelled a huge amount in what we would call Eastern Europe. I came to Ukraine in 1980, for example. Uh, and I travelled all the way through Eastern Germany, I was in Hungary, Romania, Poland, Lithuania, uh, Estonia. I don't think there was an Eastern European country that I didn't go to. Now, luckily, you're all much too young to really remember what that time was like. But the moment you went across the border to Eastern Europe, you became aware very quickly of how much was close to you, or to the people who lived there how much was closed. I once had an absolutely terrifying uh, experience. Well, terrifying is perhaps too strong. But uh, I was making a film, uh, and we had to do some scenes in East Germany. Uh, this is in 1985. And we were very well looked after <laughs> by the Stasi, but also by, we were filming in Halle, which is uh, 50 kilometers inside the East German border. And uh, uh, our, our principal hosts were the professor of English, uh, yes, the professor, no, professor of music at Halle University, and his wife, who was the professor of English. So it was a very distinguished academic family who were really our hosts. And um, we went, we were invited to dinner with them one night, and inevitably, I mean, I, me and my principal actor, uh, an actor called Trevor Howard, I'm sure you know. Uh, and we went to have dinner with him. And of course, the Stasi man came with us. And it was very nice, very simple dinner. We had a good time. Anyway, eventually the Stasi man said, uh, well, it's effect, well, I'm going home now. I'm sure uh, you know, you'll find your way back to the hotel. I'll, the car is waiting outside, no problem. So off he went. And immediately he'd gone. And they, they watched through the window to make sure he'd gone. They opened a cupboard that was in the sitting room. And inside the cupboard was a television. And they turned the television on, and they immediately started to watch West German television. It's 50 kilometers away. And it so happened that no sooner had they turned it on than it was the adverts. It was an advert break. And it was, I forgot what the, the, the thing was that they were selling, but it was, the scene was taking place in the supermarket. And in the supermarket, you could see everything. Every vegetable, every fruit, every tin, every cereal, everything that you could possibly want was in this supermarket. Now in Halle, there was one, I really do mean one, it's a big town, not as big as this, but big town, one vegetable shop. We went to it. We found about 10 old potatoes, no uh, apples, no bananas, no oranges, nothing. This shop was empty. So I now say to the two, these two very distinguished academics, I said, don't you think that there's something wrong with the system which 50 miles away has every conceivable fruit, vegetable, blah, 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 and you have nothing? Ah, they said, those pictures are Western propaganda. <laughs> Didn't understand. Did not understand. Now, the reason I tell that story is because I kept thinking last night that at the time when all of that music of the mid-60s was happening, you didn't have access to it in the way that we did, except occasionally on the, uh, on the air, or on uh, illegal radio, or sometimes the records would come. It was closed to you, effectively. Not you, but your parents. Closed to you. So suddenly, 
common market, the wall has come down, etc., etc. All of this music is flooding you. And I thought what was wonderful about last night was to see people of an older generation, there weren't too many young people there, I think you were the youngest person there, um, of an older generation absolutely loving this music. And I thought, finally, this music is sailing east. And somebody asked me also uh, last night, what, what, what music do you think uh, young people will really like today? I can tell you, it's a very simple answer to that. Um, about 11 years ago, I was foolish enough to get married, and I now have three small children, 10, 9, and 7. All they listen to is the Beatles. That's the only music they want to listen to. So it's wonderful. So it's getting through to yet another generation. So that was the concert last night. What was the other question? Oh, what of today? Well, there isn't very much. I mean, I mentioned earlier this big series I made, All You Need Is Love. It deals with an episode on jazz, an episode on blues, an episode on swing, an episode on rock and roll, and so on and so on and so on. What is interesting about it is that each of the musical forms that we looked at, blues, uh, country music, jazz, work, followed exactly the same paths, exactly the same. Let's take country music, okay? Country music starts with me, for example, me, guitarist, and with a guitar. I can't play the guitar, but you have to imagine this. Me and a guitar, I'm strumming away, I'm singing a love song to you. My darling, I love you, blah, 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 blah. I'm up in, sorry, I'm up in the mountains of the Ozarks, and I'm singing this happy little love song. Happens to be rather a good song, okay? You come along. You see the effect that I'm having making this song, so you say, why don't we record this song? Sure, why not? Oh, by the way, sign this bit of paper, then you, you lose the copyright, you keep the copyright. So now you have a record. There was also, in the mid-30s, uh, in the United States, radio. So now, either you get me to come, I love you, my darling, etc., to play on the radio, or you play the record. Suddenly, a lot of people are hearing, I love you, etc., etc. So, big business hears this, and they think, this is a good song on the radio, a record. I can make money out of this. So more and more and more money is made. So suddenly, this simple little love song has no meaning whatsoever. Not from me to you. It's a kind of meaningless song. That's the pattern that happens. Now, if you want proof of that, watch. I can't recommend it, but I try watching any MTV Music Awards show, which are on television frequently, and ask yourself, what the hell does that have to do with making music? It has nothing to do with making music at all. It's only to do with making money. Now, I'm not against making money, but don't try and tell me at the same time that this is an important cultural event. Yes, it's an important cultural event depicting the end of the world, but it's not an important cultural event depicting something really important and interesting. So the music has been sold and emasculated and wrecked and ruined. And that happened to the blues, it happened to jazz, it happened to country music. Watch MTV Awards. So to answer your question is, I'm not optimistic. I don't hear much that I like. There's a wonderful singer called Adele. I don't know whether you've heard Adele. That's an amazing voice. If she looks after herself, that's an absolutely amazing voice. There will always be singers, and there will always be singers of songs. And we can just hope that the big business doesn't wreck them. And the good thing about Adele, for example, which is why I think there's a little hope, is that she's a real tough East End girl. I mean, she swears, she doesn't give tuppence about what she looks like, whether she's fat, nothing. If someone comes along and combs her hair, she'll ruffle it straight away to make sure it's not. She wants to sing what she wants to sing, and she wants to sing it well. She's a wonderful singer, Adele. I recommend Adele. So there is hope. Because, as I said, there are always singers, and there will always be singers of songs. So, and there will always be popular music. There has to be. But I'm not optimistic, generally. Because I watch MTV Awards, and I feel 
Like I wanted to commit arson. I wanted to burn the place down. 